good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the Hillsdale College Allen P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship and to this First Principles on First Friday's lecture, which is part of a monthly lecture series that addresses significant and timely political, historical, and economic topics from a constitutional perspective. Uh, my name is Tim Kaspar, and I serve as Associate Vice President for External Affairs at the college, where I also teach uh, in the politics department. I'm pinch hitting today for my colleague and friend, uh, David Bob, uh, who usually hosts these lectures. Uh, David and his lovely wife, Anna, are expecting their second child, so we had to attend to more important matters. Uh, the Kirby Center marks an extension of Hillsdale College's commitment to the Constitution. Through teaching the enduring principles of the American Declaration of Independence and Constitution, the Kirby Center seeks to inspire citizens, students, teachers, policymakers, and elected officials to return those principles to their central place in American political life. Uh, now, I can't help but mention that today's uh, lecture topic reminds me of Ronald Reagan's famous warning about the 10 most dangerous words in the English language. Uh, Hi, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. <laughs> Uh, of course, Reagan's joke, as usual, uh, has a serious point, a point he made memorably in his first inaugural, that rule by bureaucratic experts eventually replaces rule by consent, uh, sorry, rule by the people or government by consent. The longer this goes on, the harder it becomes to recover the Founder's Constitution. Uh, to help us think more clearly about our current crisis, we have invited, uh, well, an expert. Um, but I'm happy to say she's not here to try and rule you, uh, but merely to offer advice for a country in need of it. To introduce her, I'll ask Hillsdale College student Brad Dietzen to come forward. Brad is a senior, class of 2012, and has been interning at the Kirby Center this summer. Brad. Veronique Derouze is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. She was previously a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a policy analyst at the Cato Institute, and a research fellow at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. Her areas of expertise include the federal budget, homeland security, taxation, tax competition, and financial privacy issues. She writes a column for Reason Magazine and is a regular contributor to The American. She also blogs at The Corner, at National Review Online, and at Big Government. Dr. Derouze earned an MA in Economics from the University of Paris Dauphine and a PhD in Economics from the University of Paris Sorbonne. Today, Dr. Derouze will be speaking on the timely and pressing topic of the debt limit increase. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Derouze. Hi everyone, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, um, I wanted to uh, first tell you that I've been to Hillsdale. At some point I had an aspiration to actually teach at Hillsdale and I was like, it was Hillsdale or nothing. And then I decided, you know, that really, I mean, teaching maybe was not for me, I was just, you know, and the think tank world was better, but I can tell you, I mean, I really, really considered really hard uh, Hillsdale because it seems to be kind of a, just a phenomenal, um, you know, place to, uh, to teach. So now, the topic of uh, this talk, uh, the debt ceiling. So as the debt ceiling showdown heads to its final stage, everyone is seeking to gain, uh, to, to gain the battle of uh, public's uh, relations war, right? Lawmakers, of course, they feel a lot of pressure because the stakes are really high. Confrontation like this one um, of this sort become the defining moment of a political life that distinguishes statesmen from mere politicians. But ha as Harry Truman stated, a statesman is just a politician who's been dead for 15 years. <laughs> what doesn't often happen, however, is the opportunity to correct a deep, chronic problem. And that's the real reason, maybe the only reason why actually this debt ceiling debate really truly matters. It forces a real national discussion about the real problem that this, that this nation face, and that's unrestrained government spending. So do not lose the focus, no matter what you hear. 
on this real problem. The real problem is that unconstrained government spending has put this country on an unsustainable path. The real problem is that if Congress doesn't address this chronic appetite for spending, right, the path will lead to fiscal ruin. The real problem is that the federal government spends too much money. So today, I would like to, um, to go over uh, the following points. First, the debt ceiling, which was put in place for Congress to assert its mandate to control spending has completely failed. I mean, second, whether we like it or not, the debt ceiling will have to be raised because there just simply aren't any budget out there that have been proposed that do not require to raise the amount of borrowing uh, by the federal government, at least in the short run. Third, default would be a terrible option. It actually should not be on the table. However, raising the debt ceiling without addressing the real problem of chronic overspending is at least as bad in the short term and far, far worse in the long term. Congress should not take a bad deal under false pretenses. Fourth, I have great news for you today. Taking a bad deal or defaulting on our debt are not the only options available to Congress right now. It's not very often that people you know, show up in front of you and give you good news, right? There are many things, I mean, they're not necessarily easy things, but there are many, many things that actually Treasury can do to avoid a default until Congress actually reaches a deal um, or an agreement that puts this um, country on a different path. Finally, whatever deal Congress and lawmakers agree to make, this is a deal that needs absolutely to signal to our investors that the United States is addressing again its chronic problem of overspending and it's taking solid steps, real, solid step, right, in putting in fiscal health in order. Probably through, I mean, and we'll, we'll go through this, I'll show that actually through institutional reform is probably the best way. So now, a brief history of the debt ceiling. So the debt ceiling was first put in place in 1917, right, as part, um, uh, as, as a bill to borrow more money to fund the First World War, right? And the idea was that by limiting the uh, authority that the government had to borrow more money, and more importantly, by getting Congress to go and ask for the permission to borrow more money when, once we hit that limit, that would actually kind of command some accountability on the, fact of, uh, on the part of lawmakers. Unfortunately, as we know today, the debt ceiling and, and its original intended mission is completely failed. Since it was put in place, the government has raised the debt ceiling almost 100 times. In the last 10 years, as you can see in this chart, the debt ceiling has been raised 10 times, sometimes twice in one year. That's where you have you know, the little triangles. Um, so basically, it has not worked. Uh, do you want to put the second? Um, However, unfortunately, I am certain, as I've said, that the debt ceiling will have to be raised at least one more time. And as I said, it's because there just aren't any plans out there that doesn't require for the federal government to borrow more money. Not Chairman Ryan's plan, not the Republican Study Committee's plan, and obviously not President Obama's plan, which uh, in his budget showed an increase in the debt held by the public, uh, doubling from $9 trillion to $18 trillion in the next 10 years. And that goes to the core of our problem. Um, Republicans and Democrats alike are addicted to spending. As this chart shows, it's the explosion in spending, not the lack of revenue, that had created the gigantic fiscal imbalance that we suffer from today. And 
It is a gigantic explosion in autopilot programs such as Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security that make this gap bigger and bigger as time goes by. Now, um, the concern, as you know, because you, if you read the newspaper, that's all we hear about. The concern and the threat is that if we do not raise the debt ceiling, the government will have to um, default on its debt come August 2nd, right? So again, let me be clear. I really think that a default should not be an option. Um, it would be very, very serious if uh, the US had to default on its debt. However, it would be just as irresponsible for Congress to continue to increase, raise the debt ceiling without putting in place credible planned to reduce its spending and future government spending. I mean, that's what they've been doing the last, what, 80 years, and thinking that doing the same thing over and over again would actually bring about different results is what? It's the definition of insanity, right? Uh, and why is it that it's so important? And that's because investors are investors. I mean, we always hear, right? I mean, the fear is that investors are gonna freak out if we don't raise the debt ceiling because they're gonna be afraid that we're gonna default and not pay their bill. But the truth is that investors, they're not just concerned about whether we're gonna be able to pay our debt today, whether we're gonna be able to pay our debt on August 2nd, on August 3rd, in a month, or in a year. They're actually concerned about whether we're gonna be able to pay our debt today past August 3rd, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, and then when we pay these bills, that we pay them with a currency that's actually worth something. That's important, right? And why is it? I mean, because there are three ways to pay down our debt. There are three ways. Cutting spending, increasing taxes, or printing money. I mean, what this debate is saying is basically cutting spending and increased taxes are not popular options. And investors really full well understand that the third option is actually much more political feasible. Not to mention that it's been done before. Actually, it's been done um, the last two years a lot, right? We can print out our debt, we can print money and pay down our debt this way. So what do investors do when they fear this threat? What they do is that they actually ask for an inflation premium. And that means you know, an increase in interest rate. So make no mistakes, the biggest threat to the United States long-term fiscal security is not whether the debt ceiling increase happens today, tomorrow, in August, or later, but whether lawmakers, again, I really wanna stress this point because it is a point that is rarely, you rarely read about this in the newspaper, whether lawmakers put in place credible plan to reduce their common practice of borrowing funds to pay for their daily expenses. I mean, you don't do this, I don't do this, but that's what they do, and continue a sad record of unsustainable spending. Investors will be watching to see inv investors put these measures in place um, before the autopilot program of Social Security, Medicare, Medicare explode, and with them, interest on in our debt, and start consuming a larger and larger and larger part um, of our resources. So in that context, let me say something, which again, we haven't heard very much, even though it is starting actually to make its way in the media. The date of August 2nd, which is supposedly the date of our imminent default, right, is somewhat arbitrary. The world, you will remember, right, did not come to an end on May 16th, which was the latest date where we were supposed to hit uh, the debt ceiling and we were going to, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, you were, we were going to hit the debt ceiling. And in the same way, comes August 2nd, the world will not come to an end. Contrary to what you hear, there is a world, a world of difference between hitting the debt ceiling and defaulting on our debt. Um, I know it may come as a surprise because when you, um, when you hear about this, um, when you, uh, when you hear the date of August 2nd and hitting the debt ceiling, you have this, everyone makes the assumption that it means inevitably we're gonna default. And this is the great news. 
So by the way, this table shows you the last four times Treasury Geithner, like oh, the last four days that Treasury Geithner has told us we were going to default if we didn't uh, immediately raise the debt ceiling, right? And the latest one is August 2nd. So the great news, we don't have to default on our debt. Um, sure, there is no way to wait or to continue the brinksmanship of the past few weeks, but if more time is necessary, I'd like to stress this sentence, if more time is necessary, Treasury Geithner and the Treasury Department has some option that it can use to avoid a default until we reach a deal that is acceptable. Acceptable, not politically, acceptable in order to put America back on track. So first, Treasury can take some uh, financial steps, right? The uh, extraordinary measure, I'm sorry, this is a really hard word for me to say with my French mouth. <laughs> so I'm not gonna say it again. You know, I'm gonna spare you. Um, so there are things it can do, it can do. And, it, and in fact, this is how, you know, it's been able to uh, basically move these dates. Some of the things it can do, and it's, it's doing right now, is basically um, stop, for instance, putting money in the federal employee's uh, pension. Uh, trust fund. It can also um, borrow, it basically can have the, um, the, um, the Federal Reserve, to some extent, borrow money um, for Treasury, because that doesn't necessarily count um, against the debt ceiling. Um, there's a bunch of things like this that it can do. Um, second, and Treasury can prioritize is payment. I mean, that's what we do as families. We have budgets and we know. I mean, if you're students, you have student loans, you have to buy food, you have your movie budget. If you, you know, if you're um, a family, you have a house, a mortgage payment, you have college tuition, you have all of that stuff, right? And we know basically that in order, I mean, I know in my case, not to get in big trouble when financial times are hard, no matter what I do, I need to continue paying my mortgage. Well, it's the same with Treasury. It's the same with Treasury. A technical default means that basically the, the Treasury Department stops or fails to pay interest on our debts and the principal that's come due. And as you can see on this chart, in 2011, the federal government will be collecting overall $2.2 trillion. We have um, a commitment of $3.7 trillion, which kind of is where like our little problem, you know, lays, <laughs> right? But what we know is that with those $2.2 trillion, right, there's more than enough to pay all the interest in our debt for the entire year of 2011, and that's roughly $215 billion, right? That's enough, and that guarantees that we avoid any technical default. The good news is that we, we, can also, have, we also have enough money to pay all of Social Security benefit, Medicare and Medicaid, and even we have $400 billion left over to pay, um, to pay for military salaries or, what, what is important to know, by the way, is that Treasury Geithner has the authority to prioritize payment. It has this authority. What does it mean for today? Right, this is for 2011. Um, from what I read recently, the Treasury will be collecting until the end of the fiscal year, that's September 30th, um, another $172 billion. And the remainder of the interest that are due on our debt is roughly $29 billion. And that means that there's still more money to pay for other priorities, whatever they may be. So um, that's um, an option. It does mean, of course, that if revenue were the only thing available to Treasury, we would have to engage in dramatic spending cuts. But here's the second good news of this talk. Who say I was a pessimist? There's more than this. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm all in favor of cutting spending. 
But that's the other argument that you hear all the time, right? It's like, oh well, it's horrible. Not paying any of our bill is in effect a default. But we don't have to not pay all of our, all of our bills. These are commitments that have been made, fine. Treasury has assets that it can actually set, that it can actually um, use to um, pay the rest of its bill. Uh, my colleague, Jason Fickner, and I, we've actually put together a very, very, very conservative list of the assets that are available for Treasury to use to actually continue paying our bills. I'm not talking about selling real estate or real, uh, Greek style privatization here. I'm not saying, you know, they'll just let sell Union Station. Even though it kind of sound like a good idea, but um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how about we sell our TARP assets? Wouldn't that seem like a good idea? On the books, there's roughly $170 billion of such assets. Treasury also has non-restricted cash on hand for the amount of $113 billion. And there are other type of things. There's gold, um, and which are valued on the book you know, at $42 an ounce, which obviously is not necessarily um, its current value. I mean, even though I recognize that once the US starts dumping its gold, you know, its price is likely to go down. However, you know, for all the people who are saying, you know, well, if you start selling your assets now, I mean, no one is going to actually buy them to you at the price that they're on the book. They're going to play hardball. But isn't that a better option? Isn't that a better option than actually defaulting on our debt? And by the way, I do agree. I mean, I do agree. I mean, these are not good options. I mean, in a perfect world, you know, in a perfect world, um, it would be better to liquidate these assets when it's the most convenient for us. In a perfect world, would rather be able, as a family, to pay all of our bill without having to uh, tap into our savings. But this is not a perfect world. It is a world where lawmakers make decisions to spend more and more money than they actually have. And I'm not uh, even going to comment on what they're spending it on. Um, so selling these assets are not necessarily a desirable option. However, it beats defaulting on our debt. You know, and it gives more time for Congress and the President to work out a deal to raise the debt ceiling in exchange for future spending constraints, which is what we need. Raising the debt ceiling without serious commitment to changing the fiscal path that this country is on will signal to investors that Treasury debt is riskier after we raise the debt ceiling than before we raised it. It doesn't seem like a good deal to me, right? And, and anyone who actually thinks about it a little bit, I mean, would kind of understand that this makes sense. Even though, again, remember, what we hear all of the time is that investors are going to be worried if we raise the debt ceiling, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, basically if we don't continue borrowing more. So it's true that if we have to sell these assets, right, uh, it's possible, I mean, it's possible that investors um, are going to are gonna just, you know, kind of say, well, maybe, you know, we need to require some, uh, some uh, higher interest rate. But if we raise the debt ceiling without selling any of these assets, if we raise the debt ceiling without a serious commitment to this country and to, to investors and future investors, we are sure that interest rates are going to actually raise, uh, go, go up quite dramatically. We, I mean, we know that. I mean, in fact, you know, we've been reading a lot of the academic literature. I mean, for instance, like uh, Carmen Rain, uh, Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff, I mean, their latest paper, I mean, these guys are actually very, um, they've, they've written um, many fascinating papers that were, have been reviewed and much talked about because um, they've showed that basically looking at 200 countries over a long period of time, that basically there is a point where when debt becomes, as a ratio, as a share of GDP becomes big enough, then 
the economy starts to collapse. Of course, it makes sense. And in one of their latest paper called A Decade of De Debt, they actually make the case um, that absolutely, when a country is on track historically to have debt and debt and debt and debt, what happens is interest rates go up. And they can go up very erratically overnight, but they do go up. Interestingly, in their paper, they never, ever talk about how interest rates and investors freak out because a country is trying to actually put its house in order. Um, so while bond investors seem to shrug off uh, brinksmanship in the short run, they're likely to stop not being worried about the US in the long run. Um, so reducing spending and putting this these, uh, reform in place would be really important first to give us some cash, but also uh, to send the signal to investors that we're doing the right thing. And more importantly for all of us, right? it would be important because it means our country is getting back on track. So what is the real solution? The real solution are spending cuts and true institutional reform. Right? I mean, I've talked about how the only reason why we have a debt ceiling crisis right now is because of overspending by Republicans and Democrats alike over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? Um, and while I, you know, I applaud the talk about spending cuts packages that we hear about, you hear $4 trillion, uh, $2 trillion. I mean, we've been down that road before. I mean, spending packages or, or uh, you know, deal packages with like large spending cuts and also tax increases, we know where that goes. Usually those spending cuts, they're hardly real. Usually in our, you know, in, 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 in the best case scenario, they're cut in the growth of spending and or in the worst case scenario, they don't even happen and yet we're stuck with the revenue increase. So that's why, instead of getting this one-time spending cut, real or not real, I think it would be way more important to put in place institutional reforms that actually really changes the way things are done in Washington and ties the hands of Congress and lawmakers. So what kind of institutional reforms do I talk about? Well, ideally, very strict and strong budget caps, right? And um, things with like budget rules that actually bite, that can't be really overturned. The problem with um, these type of caps, while they sound good, is that they can't really constrain the hands of future Congresses. Right? I mean, we've seen it before. Um, something I've studied a lot is uh, the abuse of the emergency spending system. I mean, and there were actually strong, supposedly strong budget rules that were put in place so the emergency, uh, emergency bills and emergency spending wouldn't happen without having to offset the spending or, um, or for spending that was actually not an emergency. Well. Years after years, Congress have let those rules expire. And in 2002, basically the last of the rules that constrained the use of emergency spending was expired. And then we got you know, a gigantic abuse in the last 10 years. So I think that one of the things that would actually matter is to have some sort of constitutional amendment to constrain once and for all the ability of Congresses and administration to put us on a path that leads to our fiscal ruin. Thanks to the wisdom of the founders, our Constitution has a system of check and balances. So let us suppose that thanks to this Constitution, after we change it and reform it, Every man is no longer a knave, but instead a statesman, even before death. The debt crisis gives every lawmaker in this country an opportunity to restore some limits and constraint on government's endless appetite for spending. The United States needs some urgent spending and institutional reform. 
There is enough expected tax revenue and assets, right, as I explained, on hand to avoid the unattractive uh, options of defaulting uh, on our debt, right? So let's use it and let make sure that we get a deal, a real deal. Um, Congress and the administration have time to work out that deal, as I've explained. And that would, yes, you know, lead to an increase in the debt ceiling in the short run, but more importantly, it needs to be a deal that would reduce spending and institute reform that would shrink the deficit and get the nation's spending and debt under control. What we want is a deal that solves problems, not adds new problems like all the deals we've had before. And now I'll take all of your questions. So, so I've left a lot of the details. Um, please, yep. It sounds very much like what you're talking about is what the Republicans are calling cut, cap, and balance with a balanced budget amendment into the Constitution. The real problem, as you've identified, is that no one Congress can bind the hands of the next Congress. Uh, do you agree with the cut, cap, Um, I think certainly that proposal is going in the right direction and is actually underlying the right principles uh, of a possible deal that needs to be striked. Um, my only concern always with lawmakers is that I want to read the fine lines, right? And right now, it's a talking point, you know, cut, cap and balance. And I haven't seen, what I want to see is like basically, you know, where, where will that, what, what will concretely these rules look like and will they actually really tie the hands of Congress? But I think these are the right principles. Does it have a chance to uh, pass? Um, you know, I think the political reality um, and you know, when people say it's not politically feasible, this is a very relative term. Maybe it's not politically feasible right now, but who says that it's not in six months? Who says it's not in a year? So I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't understand Washington. I don't understand what drive these guys, but I hope that it's possible, especially if those rules that they put in are actually binding. Yes. Doesn't that also allow for increasing spending? Because if you have um, a budget that uh, spends more than last year's, well, then all you have to do is raise taxes to balance it off. Uh, at least that's my um, understanding of how that might yeah, work, so and I could be wrong. It's a very good question. So I have, you know, I have mixed feelings about budget, uh, budget um, amendments, um, constitutional amendment. And one is like, again, how is it designed? Because you can balance the budget at 80% of, uh, of GDP, and you know, we wouldn't want that, right? However, um, while I, and, I, and I agree with you, right, on paper, when you have to have a balanced budget, you can actually, lawmakers will inevitably, inevitably say, listen, we're not gonna cut all this and we need to raise revenue in order, uh, in order to balance the budget. The problem is that in the end, you can raise taxes and it's not necessarily obvious that you're gonna actually be able to raise the revenue that you want to raise. While it may look like it on paper, one of the things that we know from the last 40 years or even longer is that no matter how high marginal interest rates have been, right, you know, 
90%, uh, 35%, the federal government has failed to actually raise much more than 90% of GDP in revenue for more than a year or two, right? So when you actually have a budget balance amendment in place, right, on paper, they can say this is the route we're gonna go, but at the end of the, at the, end of the day, if they don't manage to actually raise that revenue, they're gonna have to kind of meet that requirement and cut spending. So I mean, I, I'm with you. I mean, there's a lot of things that I worry about but I, I do also th see it as, as um, something that can be extremely useful, especially if it's designed well, you know, yeah. How about, um, has there been any talk on single issue bills, like maybe a constitutional amendment where you can come, it's a tie from the Because obviously the, de the deficit problem comes from the growth of government. So to, to limit the growth of government, you do single issue, like a constitutional amendment that would limit to just single issue bills instead of throwing millions of things in these bills. I mean, it seemed, to me, it seems like a pretty reasonable idea. You know, I don't know about this. First, I'm not an expert on this issue, but I would, uh, I would recommend that you actually go on the Mercatus website and look at the work of uh, David Primo, who is a professor at Rochester. He's written, first, a fantastic book about, um, about institutional uh, rules that actually tends to constrain government, and he has written shorter paper that are, you can find on our website. And, and basically, um, he has thought very thoroughly about what are the condition and the uh, and, and the type of, uh, of rules that you need to actually really effectively tie budget hands. So I'm not, I mean, it sounds like a good idea. I am sure that Primo, and by the way, I'm sure you can also contact him and ask him questions. Uh, Primo will be able to answer your question. Yep, sorry. Yep. yep. Well, it seems to me that uh, any successful negotiation depends on good faith on the part of the participants. Uh, and in other words, the long-term good health of the country in this case. Um, is it possible that there, some of the participants in all this um, actually want a disaster, say a default, that they can then blame on the other party? Uh, are there some people that perhaps value their own political future more than they value the long-term health of the country? It's all, I mean, it's always possible. I mean, I can't obviously judge intent um, of people. I want to believe that you know, it's not the case. Um, I can't judge intent. One of the things, however, that I can tell you is I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat worried about uh, the way both sides talk about this debate. Uh, because even, even on the more free market, we want to restrain government spending side, right? There is this underlying assumption that comes August 2nd, that the world is going to hell. Right, and that means that basically it doesn't give much of an incentive for Treasury to actually really do everything they can to avoid a default. And one of the things that I've been saying is what, what, the reason why it is actually risky to actually continue talking about August 2nd as if this is like the date where we're, we're gonna default is that basically if there is such intention among anyone with power in the administration, they get the cover that everyone knew that on August 2nd, things were going to go bad. And uh, the good news, honestly, is, uh, as I said, Jason Fickner and I, we've been like, talking a lot about these issues and about all the options that we have and about the fact that this August 2nd date was somewhat arbitrary, and now you see it more and more in actually newspaper. There was actually an article um, in the Washington Post. There's this guy, Glenn Kessler, who does a, uh, he does a, a column called uh, Fact Checker, and he's, you know, he's not necessarily um, a raging, free market person, but he's really well intentioned uh, and he does his work very seriously. And in, in this column he said, obviously August 2nd is not set in stone and you start hearing this more and more. And that I think is good news. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just touch very briefly on what's happening in China right now and how they're trying to um, uh, seriously avoid a recession and how maybe that is a bigger issue to talk about rather than necessarily our impending doom if August 2nd hits without a debt ceiling. I mean, I think it's a pretty, um, 
I mean, I think it's a pretty, uh, it's a very good point. Um, you know, one of the reasons why investors are not too worried about America right now is because all their eyes are on Europe, right? I mean, the European crisis is actually really bad, and it was a long time coming. It's kind of like, I don't want to be like, I told you so. In fact, you know, I actually moved away <laughs> from Europe <laughs> because <laughs> I knew it was coming. Um, but. Um, so that is actually kind of investors, you know, rated country on a curve. So as long as we're, you know, not the ugliest one at the beauty pageant, we're fine. But we're really not that fine because we are in a global uh, economy, and there is a very big risk that if Europe just goes down through basically cont contagious contagion from you know um, Greece to Portugal, Italy, Spain, um, Ireland, and all these other countries, it will reach us. And then there's a China issue. I've actually been thinking that one of the reasons why you know in, for the longest time um, economists have had have never been able to actually really show a connection between the size of our deficit and level of interest rates. And one of the reasons is because so far, right, so far there's been enough capital flowing in, right, so that actually we can't see the connection. But what happens once, um, once actually the amount of capital flowing to our country not necessarily stops, but actually slows down? You know, we will start seeing, I mean, consequences, and that main consequences will be an increase in interest rates. And China, right, owns a lot of our debt and is also send, sends a lot of, um, it's like, so one trillion out of the four trillion, um, uh, roughly four trillion um, debt that we have, that we owe to foreigners comes from China, maybe a little bit more. And what happens if, in fact, they hit a recession and it means that they can't send as much money our way. So, I mean, I do worry about this, you know. The other thing, by the way, about China is like, as you've heard, I mean, there is a sense that the U.S. long-term uh, fiscal health doesn't look too good, right? And one of the things that we can see is when you have like the biggest bondholder, like uh, PIMCO, for instance, basically turning its long-term debt into short-term debt, and when China is doing it and Russia is doing it, um, you know that things are not looking too good uh, for the future. Does that answer your question? Um, I'm gonna go a little there and I'll come back. Yes. Uh, thank you, Veronique. Um, the focus on the debt crisis, I think, highlights the longer term, at least as I see it, drift towards, in the United States, a more European, style reliance on government and socialism. Um, you have thoughts first on whether 20 years from now, separate from dealing with this debt crisis, that politically we're, uh, as a society, we're gonna be more like your, with all due respect, your, all, uh, your homeland and, uh, in Europe, or more like uh, an America of past as, re as it comes to fiscal responsibility. And relatedly, do you have any observations, even if anecdotal, about what you have seen in France in your life and elsewhere in Europe as to how, through that reliance on government and the confiscatory tax policies, that actual entrepreneurialism is affected negatively and that society lives differently? That's what we talk about here, at least I do with others theoretically, but what have you observed with your own eyes? Thank you. So there's um, a lot in there. And first, I would like to tell you that I really do not want America to end up like France, because it would be even worse, because it would be like gigantic government and no stinky cheese <laughs> and unpasteurized milk. And I would have to be forced to shower every day. No, it's not possible. It's not an option. And this is why I'm fighting. This is, I mean, this is, this is the fight, my friends. So we don't end up like this. But one of the things you have to understand about Europe, what is it about Europe, right? It's, I mean, so they think they're uh, more generous and things like this, but really the defining criteria about European governments, no matter, and some are worse, obviously, than others, it is the fact that a gigantic share of the population actually depends 
on government spending, or not necessarily depends, but receives some government spending. The French, obviously, everyone gets something from the government through free education, um, healthcare. Everyone, no matter what your level of income is, right, you get something back. If you're wealthy and you have three kids, you get a whole lot of things. I mean, there's, there's the whole, and, and so far, and so you can imagine when, when most people get something from the government, even though it actually is a terrible deal because what they get is nothing compared to what they pay, not only through their taxes, but through slow rate, lower standards of living, higher prices, high unemployment, right? Um, it's harder to change things because there's so many uh, people who are reluctant to change whatever it is they know for something that they don't know. And what's, what's, what's very different in America, what is very different in America is in addition to actually have a philosophy that actually does truly believe in individualism, responsibility, entrepreneurship, and things like this, um, there were also fewer, much fewer people who actually you know, depend or receive government services. Um, at least at the federal level, it's true. And during the recession, one of the things that I was really worried about is when, um, when I was reading stories about how you know, more than half of state's budget now were, uh, were made of, you know, spend, I mean, basically uh, transfer from the federal government. And also, when I was reading stories about a growing number of Americans actually um, I think it's 50% now, you know, are actually getting something from the federal government. Well, it's, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, so there's 47% um, of American filers who actually don't pay the income tax. But that, I mean, first, most of them, with exceptions, are very poor, and that's because Congress, one after the other is decided to distribute social benefits through the tax code. Uh, when you actually, um, when you actually, um, and, and, and again, you know, uh, much fewer people don't pay the payroll tax, and then almost everyone, except in, in lucky states where there's no sales tax, pay the sales tax. So I mean, this is what I really worry about: is basically, you know, creating these bills. Um, you know, the health care bill, basically, that, base, that starts like actually, you know, increasing the number of people who actually get something, even if it's a, if it, even if it's a bad deal, you know, because you just kind of like, it makes you basically um, someone who may be reluctant to give up what it is you have. And yes, um, I can tell you my own experience, certainly, I mean, just in France, um, I mean, very high unemployment, at least at the time where I was there. It went down, but it's still true like for women, for young people. Um, very hard, it's very hard to start a business, and one of the reasons is because you have to jump through a lot of regulatory hoops. But also, you know, before you start, you have all these social taxes that you have to pay, even before you start making a dime, and they're way higher, much more expensive than um, they are in America. But I think more dramatically to me is the inability to think outside of the box, and not to actually think that the government is the answer to everything. Don't ask me how I was so different there. My parents would always look at me and say, like, how did we fail, you know? And it was just like, but, you know, so, yeah, I mean, so I have, I mean, I've seen, you know, I've seen my uncle, you know, because the problem in France, for instance, is, uh, when you, one of the, I mean, right now things are like different, but I mean, one of the recurring thing about unemployment in France, not only was it higher, right, but when you were unemployed, you stayed unemployed. You stayed unemployed, I know. And for the longest time, American had like unemployment rates that were much lower, but also the time where people would stay, would be unemployed was actually much, much shorter. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, uh, it's, you know, this is my fear, this is the fight, you know. I didn't think I was coming here to fight that fight all over again, but here, here I am. <laughs> there was a, do you have a question? This will be our last question. Really? 
Oh, yeah. Um, there were reports from unnamed officials in the Obama administration that he is uh, considering um, using the 14th Amendment to argue that the credit of the United States has to be respected and therefore um, continue to spend even if Congress doesn't pass any kind of spending bill. I'm just wondering what you thought of that argument and how Congress should react to it. Okay, so again, you know, I'm an economist. I am uh, not a lawyer, but uh, if, if you're interested actually in this issue, you should uh, go to the Vorlock conspiracy and look at the writing by uh, Jonathan Adler. I mean, that's pretty much where I know wh what I know about this uh, issue. And, uh, and also uh, um, one of my daughter's uh, friend, uh, her, her dad actually, 10 years ago wrote um, a, a law review article about how actually it is unconstitutional Probably, I guess, because lawyers always kind of like probably everything, right? Uh, to default. And what Adler, Adler was saying is if anything, what that clause means is that the president has an obligation to use, uh, to use everything in their power to make sure we don't default, right? I mean, so that's, I mean, I can't. But I, I can't tell you like the uh, in and out of the whole thing, but I would recommend you go and read what Adler has said. And, 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 if, and if, if in fact, really, I mean, it's unconstitutional to default this 14th Amendment of Section 4 is actually about how, like, if that's the case, then we shouldn't even be having this conversation about. And by the way, that leads me to my last point. One of the things that really actually makes me unbelievably mad right now and it, like, all the people who actually come back to me and say, well, selling assets is really hard. Yeah, it is hard. Or say, well, you know, all these assets on the book, because it's going to be a fire sale, we're not going to get the value we have on those books. I'm like, yeah, sure, better than a default. And by the way, what were you doing six months ago, not selling these assets already to actually pretend, uh, prevent us being in this quite dramatic situation today? This is, I mean, absolute, utterly failure of leadership. By the way, I mean, I will put it out there. I mean, this is democratic failure, but I have no faith that if we had been in the same situation with Republicans, um, we would have had better leadership on this issue. Because I actually think that lawmakers do, just don't think in long terms, you know, in the long term and, and, and the actual really well-being, financial safety of this country. We wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. We wouldn't have had like this gigantic increase in spending in the last 10 years, 60% adjusted for inflation under President Bush. I mean, we wouldn't be here if actually lawmakers really, you know, got it. So, I mean, that actually really makes me extremely mad. Thank you. Thank you.